Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Mascher. I'm the Vice Provost for International Affairs at McMaster University. And it is my great pleasure to open today's uh, panel presentation within the McMaster Global series of events. Um, we will today um, address a very important topic, not just for Canada or North America or Europe or any other specific area in the world, but arguably for the entire world. We will talk about the role of higher education in addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Before I introduce our speakers and panelists, um, I would like to acknowledge that we should begin by giving honor and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations as the traditional owners of the land where McMaster stands. To say that is to acknowledge a debt to those who were here before us and our responsibility as guests to respect and honor the intimate relationship indigenous peoples have to this land. It is now my pleasure to very briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we have with us Dr. Alex Awiti, the Vice Provost of the Aga Khan University in East Africa. We have with us Mr. Ramu Damodaran, Chief of the United Nations Academic Impact. We have with us Dr. Andrea Baumann, Associate Vice President of Global Health at McMaster University. And we have with us Dr. Greg Moran, currently Executive Director of Academics Without Borders. And again, my name is Peter Mascher. I'm the Vice Provost for International Affairs at McMaster University. The program is structured in uh, two parts. Uh, we will hear from our four panelists who will lay out their thoughts and ideas on the topic of the role of higher education in addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. After that, we have scheduled ample time for discussion and we invite all of you who are participating in this uh, webinar to post your questions in the Q&A section uh, of this uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, we have staff on hand uh, who will monitor the Q&A file and uh, we will feed the questions into the panelists uh, after they have given their presentations. So with that, uh, let me uh, introduce Dr. Alex Awiti, Vice Provost, Aga Khan University, East Africa, and invite him uh, to open uh, our panel session with his remarks. Thanks, Peter, for the welcome and the introductions. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with uh, fellow panelists, uh, friends and new faces. Um, I think this is a very timely conversation. Uh, and we do not overemphasize the steep peril and challenges that our planet faces or that we face as societies, communities, and even nation states. Uh, and it's it just worth reminding ourselves that the overarching purpose of the United Nations uh, is to maintain peace and security and to promote international cooperation in solving international problems and, and sustainable development is our most urgent existential challenge. Uh, the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, our common future, lays out the complex global challenges that define our modern existence in the Anthropocene, as Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen calls it. It lays out the problematic across four interconnected axes, uh, people, resources, uh, environment, and development. Uh, our common future framed the intellectual, political, social, and moral basis for what became the 17 goals, uh, 169 targets and 223 indicators that we now know as the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, these, these goals, as we all remember, are the successor to the eight goals that pre previously framed the Millennium Development Goals. The SDGs, I think, are a critical call to action uh, at least for the next 10 years, to launch our planet on a sustainable path. Uh, all of us as citizens of the world have a role to play in, in achieving these goals. Uh, we have a role to play as individuals and members of our communities, uh, and especially for the community gathered here as intellectual leaders, uh, scholars and students. 
uh, our universities have responded uh, admirably uh, through the creation of the uh, University Global Coalition, uh, which is a higher education for sustainable, a sustainable future. But the obligation and opportunity of universities is, is absolutely clear. Uh, and it is to educate and inspire students uh, and, and to engage and produce new ideas that lead to new solutions and, and support all of us and lead local, global, local and global efforts. Uh, we also have an important uh, opportunity to collaborate with, with communities uh, such as uh, uh, the indigenous communities uh, that, that we just pay tribute to, but also in many parts of the world, the, the, the uh, urban societies, rural communities uh, around which our universities are nested. Uh, but as we all know, our, our best arsenal, uh, what we're best at, uh, where we can make the greatest contribution is, is really through education research and service. Uh, uh, the Times Higher Education impact rankings on progress universities are making on delivering the SDGs certainly provides an incentive that academics can relate to and might just get us all excited or inspired to act. Uh, our role and real value in delivery of the SDGs is both clear and compelling, but I, get, I, I think the real question is, are we really ready? Uh, and I'll spend some time trying to figure out if we can get some consensus on whether we're ready or not. Uh, the underpinnings of the SDGs are a large set of complex and interconnected challenges and opportunities. Inevitably, the, the solutions, both actions and policies require interdisciplinary and for the most part, uh, transdisciplinary approaches. And as the greatest, one of the greatest ecologists of our time, E.U. Wilson, put it, we must embrace a mindset of consilience, the unity of knowledge, uh, the dancing together of disciplines, mathematics, physics, uh, biology, social sciences, humanities. Uh, at their core, uh, disciplinary or subject matter designations in the tradition of departments are antithetical to the idea of unity of knowledge, uh, which focuses on problems rather than the subject matter. And, and, and to meaningfully uh, uh, drive and lead the uh, uh, attainment of the SDGs, we must look to Karl Popper uh, more seriously when he says that we are not students of some subject matter, but students of problems. And problems may cut across uh, the borders of any subject matter or discipline. Uh, and, and we need, therefore, some deep reform in the academy if we are to play any leading role in the delivery of the SDGs. Uh, there is so much that we must change about curriculum design and teaching and learning and, and, and bringing the community into the academy where real problems start to emerge as critical areas of investigation and engagement by students. Uh, some of the in, in, in interventions uh, like problem and case-based learning are, are great gestures, but they have come short. Uh, we must create uh, new incentives for faculty uh, recognition as well and, and, and promotion if you had to transcend these disciplinary barriers that now completely wed everyone to uh, th this, this uh, enormous endless chase of publications that are predominantly uh, targeting uh, disciplinary academic journals. Uh, and, and then a related problem that, that we, we, we create in the process is that we're often too narrowly educated uh, to join the dots between some of the critical development challenges that are really deep inside the DNA and, 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 the, and the rise and data of the SDGs. Uh, for instance, deforestation uh, and its links to collapsing the lecture cities in, in, in our part of the world. Uh, we, we are too specialized to join the dots between teen pregnancies and, and, and national GDP our top economic professors who advise presidents and prime ministers and CEOs of, of, of foundations and corporations won't make the connection between malnutrition and the cost of public education. Uh, our national accounts can't measure the contribution of soil fertility, bees and, and, and forests to the national GDP. Uh, and, and, and if our professors can make those connections, it is only for peer reviewed publications that are not accessible uh, in, in the name, in the form of arguments uh, that can be compelling for ordinary citizens or elected leaders 
to make a case for budget allocations for conservation of biodiversity or to protect pristine environments from extractive resources. So often uh, big industry and, and, and big capital uh, trump uh, our capacity to make uh, compelling cases for our governments to allocate resources uh, to, to preserve the planet. Uh, but I, I want to submit that the academy was not born to die on, 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 on discipline here. Uh, what happened to the Catholicity of the Platonic Academy or the Aristotelian Lyceum, uh, such is our provenance, not this depleted narrow disciplinary enclaves uh, called the subject. Uh, we are designed to solve complex problems, grapple with the most consequential uh, opportunities that uh, our times present. Uh, and to quote Michael Crow, president of, uh, of ASU, the transcendence of disciplinary silo mentality is especially relevant to the advancement uh, of, of use inspired methods to advance sustainable development. Under Crow's leadership, he has demonstrated that you can eliminate traditional disciplines and academic departments uh, but some, some of the most charismatic ones, like sociology, anthropology, geology, and several areas of biology. Uh, the reforms in curriculum, therefore, uh, uh, and, and instructional models must situate a new frame of learning uh, and a new frame of action and engagement of students where solutions are co-created around problem areas with communities, which is really the, 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 uh, uh, the platform of action for sustainable development uh, attainment. These are not kinds of conjectures and uh, beautiful argumentations that exist in, in, in ivory towers that we've con constructed in the economy. We've got to create at the same time prosperity and sustainable uh, uh, livelihoods uh, for societies that eke out a living from the land. Uh, we've got to make governments start to take action uh, to combat climate change, to reduce investments in fossil fuels, to move towards uh, uh, green energy and, 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 and smart electric grids, et cetera. Uh, but we need mostly to construct these, these propositions around the academy uh, and, 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 and get professors to really engage with local communities. Um, and I guess the other point that is important is, is, is that we need more than internships and study abroad to expose students to global problems, because these are interconnected problems of planetary scale. How do you cultivate uh, and inculcate a global and planetary ethic? Uh, we, we need really massive programs that are not just sending students out for a short period of time, and we hope that they're going to learn anything. And that exchange has to be both ways. You need to get students from Africa coming into Europe students from, from Asia coming to Europe and students from Europe and North America seeing the rest of the world and, and, and starting to co-create as the next generation of, of, of academic thought leaders and political leaders will influence the direction of change that we must see. Uh, so I, I think in many cases now in the academy, more than ever, we need champions, academic leaders who won't settle for the easy path of business as usual or incremental gradualism approach, mm -hmm. uh, the change we need in the academy must be equal to the change, the existential challenge that is posed by the Anthropocene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, this was uh, most interesting and I think a, uh, extremely appropriate uh, opening and challenging opening, uh, I think for our, for our panel discussion. Um, I would like to uh, now introduce um, uh, Mr. Ramudam Modaran, um, he's the chief of the United Nations Academic Impact. Um, and uh, the United Nations by themselves, of course, are the, the inspirator of the sustainable development goals. And as such, the United Nations Academic Impact is an organization that, that speaks directly um, to the role that these United Nations Sustainable Development Goals can play in, uh, in pursuing a better world. Uh, so with that, I uh, would like to invite uh, Ramu to uh, present his, uh, his remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that generous introduction. And thank you, Alex, for setting the tone for our, for our discussion this morning. Well, we have uh, all been accustomed to the headlines we'll see in newspapers today, but I was thinking when, when I was reflecting on this conversation of 
what happened 60 years ago on the state, November the 4th, 1960. It was really a remarkable day in many respects, <clears throat> analogous to what we're talking about, the, the SDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals, because it was on that day that Jane Goodall, the famous primatologist, first saw in the Gombe National Park in Tanzania, a chimpanzee actually fashioning an instrument or a tool. So the idea that we have this measure space from what are called non-human animals, and they are able using their reservoir of intellect, of creativity, of entrepreneurship to do something which our forebears did and which we have sophisticatedly built upon over the years is telling. But even more compelling was the analogy that 20 years after Jane Goodall saw that chimpanzee, we found the first strains of HIV coming into the global landscape through chimpanzees. And I use that as a metaphor <clears throat> for development in general, because at one hand, development is essential. As Alex said, the United Nations was built on the premise of peace and security, but with the realization that that peace and security in order to be sustainable must be premised on development. And so that was the chimpanzee with the tool. But on the other hand, we found that the deleterious effects of development, whether it be environmental degradation, whether it be pushing people into hardship and poverty, whether it be shrinking the land mass we have to use as our own, all of those came in much like the HIV virus. So a single concept can be both benign and lethal. And that led to the entire idea of sustainable development. And I recognize and I'm very grateful for the fact that I'm really here with scholars and thinkers on the subject. And I'm really coming in, in a sense, as a practitioner, but also someone who's been truly amazed by the capacity of our organization, the United Nations, to come up with these goals. Because when I joined the United Nations more than 25 years ago, I would never have thought it possible that a collective of governments and more importantly, a collective of peoples would have got together and defined goals which impinge on what were their domestic affairs, their internal affairs, the lives of their nations and peoples. And here again, we have an analogy with the Jane Goodall Institute, which is uh, not too far from here, I think just a couple of uh, hours in, from, from uh, Hamilton. It's been built as you said in your wonderful invocation, Peter, reminiscent of that, on land that has been held in trust for 15,000 years. And that institute works to partner with the local community so that with consultations, the conservation strategies discourage dependence and encourage empowerment. That could well be a slogan for the SDGs teach people not to be dependent upon the earth, empower them to change the earth. And that brings in the topic that we are discussing right now, the role of higher education. When you look at the sustainable development goals themselves, there is an almost cursory reference to higher education. There is a reference saying that by 2030, the world should ensure access for all women and men to affordable and quality technical vocational and tertiary education, including higher education. So it doesn't give it a sense of standing on its own. And then we come to a sub goal a few paragraphs later, where there is a reference to the promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence and global citizenship. Now, I would argue that what the Sustainable Development Goals try to suggest was that higher education, even though it is one facet of education, is a means towards, and this is the first time that a United Nations document has used the phrase, global citizenship, the idea that we are nationals, we are proud members of our communities, but we are ultimately responsible for a larger whole, just as the United Nations is. And so when we think about 
higher education and development or sustainable development. The one fact which I would like to share with you and, and would welcome your thoughts upon is, is this limited <clears throat> or defined by very specific niche disciplines? There are development studies, there, are, there is economics, or can the whole timber of the global academic and intellectual landscape comprehend sustainable development? And this, in a sense, is what led us to create the academic impact, which, which um, I'm privileged to lead and to which you made reference, Peter, because our idea was that there was no subject or course of study which was not relevant to the United Nations. And this was in 2010. Five years later, we could expand that and say to sustainable development. One index that I've always found useful in measuring this is something as straightforward as the Nobel Prize. And I'm thinking of the Nobel Prize winners who've actually come from McMaster. In 2018, the physics prize went to Donna Strickland. It was a prize in physics, but the import of the discovery for which we received that prize led to successful eye operation for millions of people. So you have that link, if you will, between something as abstract as physics and something as practical as healthcare. You come to the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1994 and Dr. Bertram Brockhaus, and here his ability to devise a means through physics and organic chemistry to study viruses and DNA molecules in a manner which was not possible with existing microscopes. Again, a bridge between an abstract study and very practical application. You come to the 1997 Nobel Prize in Economics, which went to Myron Scholes from the university and his study of risk management in society, something which will increasingly be relevant to the sustainable development goals themselves. As we begin to factor, just as we do with conventional development, the risk factors of which we are aware, does sustainable development as we see it also bring in its factors? And of course, the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999, which meant, went to Médecin Sans Frontières and James Orbinski, who brought a career and educational background in public health to a larger cause. And it's something particularly compelling in our discussion today, because I know that both you, Peter, and, uh, and Dr. Morin are leaders in a similar community, Academics Without Borders, and the idea that these consortiums, if you will, predate but underline the relevance of both global citizenship and the sustainable development goals. I would like to fast forward from that. I began with 1960 to, to 2020, and the one thing that is obviously on all our minds, and that is what has what we have gone through in the last seven or eight months shown in the context of the SDGs. The one point I think it has shown is that there are no advanced or less developed countries in this concept of the SDGs because the countries who have been most hard hit by the pandemic are precisely those countries, whether the United States or Europe, who we would have traditionally considered to be more developed and advanced. It is also shown that something like a pand uh, pandemic, which is a health crisis, is dependent upon sustainable development goals, particularly goals 13 to, to uh, 15, the one on uh, climate action, life below water, life on land. All of these converge in the creation of the pandemic and hopefully in our ability to mitigate it. So I think what we have really learned over the course of this year is not only the vitality of higher education to the SDGs or the SDGs to higher education, but also the point that these goals need to be regarded in an integral, holistic way. Alex made reference to that, and I'm very glad that we have uh, Dr. Bauman with us, uh, Dr. Andrea Bauman, who has worked so much about the idea of a transdisciplinary model of graduate education, which brings together several countries and several universities. Because that one phrase which her professional work uses and Alex used, transdisciplinary, <clears throat> is to my mind at the heart of higher education and the SDGs. 
where you're willing to break out of the bar barriers of your own particular chosen field and explore other fields with the wisdom that your chosen field has given you. The, to extend that metaphor, the idea again of our panel, I was thinking of um, Dr. Moran and his studies about the first relationship between an infant child and her or his mother. That again is in many ways what the SDGs are about because the SDGs from 2015 were the infant child of the United Nations. They were dependent on the United Nations for the political will and sustenance, the realization that all 193 governments stood by them, just as a mother stands by her child. But then slowly, as a child develops and the SDGs have developed, there begins what you call the walking away. And I would again suggest to you that this is extremely important for us to remember, that ultimately the SDGs will not be the property or the province or the prerogative of the United Nations. They will be with we the people and the intermediary to we the people will be universities and higher education in being vigilant on their exercise and their possibility. I read about a study that Alex did in, in East Africa, where he showed that ultimately when you think about demographics, the world view and vision of young people is not radically different from generations before them. And that again is important because we cannot look at these SDGs in sectoral demographic terms. They have to be universal. And as Alex's study showed, we have much more in common between us than the differences that separate us. And if I may come to an analogy with you, Peter, and your work on, on semiconductors, in a country which is neighboring my own, Bangladesh, one of the greatest problems has been its very vibrant garment industry. But each time a garment is produced with the vivid colors that we associate with Asia, the dyes get into the water and pollute the water, often lethally. And that is where universities in Bangladesh came up with the idea of semiconductor photocatalysis, which allows those effluents to be destroyed. So here again is a practical application of a scientific or academic principle to what is really the livelihood of a people and in many ways, the livelihood of a nation. For us in the academic impact, we are privileged to have hub universities around the world, which advance the SDGs in, in Canada. We have the University of Manitoba, which does so much work around Lake Win Winnipeg in its own vicinity in that regard. In Australia, we have the Western Sydney University, which again works with indigenous communities, just as the University of Manitoba and certainly McMaster University do. And their idea is to have understandings and approaches which deal not only with intellectual or ideological matters, such as racism or respect for indigenous people, but also transfer that to a larger concern for the planet as a whole. Here, thinking again of McMaster and the wonderful initiatives that you've taken, if you look at them again in isolation, you don't immediately connect them with the SDGs. But when you have the idea of this new project you've initiated called The Connection, which addresses the Hamilton community and the university to have a collective common response to COVID-19. When you think of McMaster Health Laboratories and its work on not only predicting future pandemics, but also managing through the last project, the inflow of persons into Canada through the um, Lester Pearson International Airport in Toronto and seeing whether you can track the prevalence or the spread of a pandemic through those passenger details visibly at the airport. Peter, you are from Graz, uh, a city which, I, which I've been fortunate to know and love. And I, I know that you, the University of Graz is not your alma mater, but I was thinking of the University of Graz as a remarkable institution which has actually created a master's program in sustainable development, bringing together universities from all over the world, the Hiroshima University in Japan, Leipzig in Germany, the Research Institute in, in India. All of these have come together 
and they have created this. But what they found when they surveyed their students who took this course was that the students were not interested in sustainable development as a concept in itself alone, nor were they actuated by noble feelings of global citizenship or global identity. They saw this as a means for a fulfilling career, fulfilling intellectually, fulfilling morally, and certainly fulfilling financially. And I think this is something that we need as those involved with education to realize, that you have to actually look at the person and what she or he wants and not what you impose upon them. This, I think, to, to thank someone who's really been instrumental in getting us together, uh, Nicole, Nicole Longstaff, this is something which I think she saw when she was working with the refugee and immigrant population in Hamilton, where you really, like the SDGs, have to work at two levels. You have to make the people who come in, the people who are the beneficiaries of the process, comfortable as much as the people who, in some way or another, make a sacrifice to reach out to them. Let me pause for a moment and come to a conclusion again with an anniversary and again with, with Upper Austria, if I may. On the 4th of uh, November, 1783, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart performed for the first time his 36th symphony in Linz. He wrote it in a matter of four days. And when you listen to that symphony, you, you listen to this very brooding, almost moonlit series of oboes and bassoon. And then it moves into a brisk march. And you say, OK, this is the point where after the march, it's going to go into something much more vast and lyrical. But that does not happen. It goes on at the same pace. That is again a metaphor for where we are. Because here in 2020, with the pandemic upon us, we have either a chance to take that turn, which Mozart did not do. What will it be? Do we continue and yet protect and cherish our planet? Or do we need to make that turn? That is the dilemma we have before us. And that to my mind is where higher education comes in, allowing us to think of the possibilities, to think of their moral and intellectual values as much as their practical. And again, a final anniversary thought to end with, the 4th of November, 1973, when in the Netherlands, they began car-free Sundays, just as we now have Fridays for the future after the oil shock of 1973, after the um, war in the Middle East, the Dutch decided that they would not use cars on Sundays. That was a metaphor as far back as 1973, just after the Stockholm Conference on the Environment, but long before the idea of sustainable development had come in. So today, let's use that metaphor and think of higher education as the bicycle which will propel us forward even if it seems basic or primitive, because the cars, the automobiles, and the fossil fuels upon which we are dependent are not only going to get scarcer and scarcer, but are going to imperil us more and more. To that, and for that, I'm immensely grateful to each one of you, because you have invested your commitment in higher education to a commitment for the sustainable development goals and through them for the United Nations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ramu, uh, for your uh, truly fascinating comments. I think, um, well, there are many points that I'm sure will be taken up in the, in the question and answer session, but uh, to me, the, um, the emphasis on, on remembering back and trying to see where we stand relative to historic developments is, is a very important point, uh, because I think there's a tendency nowadays um, to, to not consider history um, and to think that anything that is happening is unique and has never been seen before. And I think that is a very dangerous uh, attitude to take. And uh, so I really appreciate your, your comments in, in that regard. Uh, let me move on now and introduce Dr. Andrea Baumann, who is Associate Vice President for Global Health uh, at McMaster University. And I would like to invite her um, to present her our comments. Andrea. Thank you, Peter. As we've heard, I mean, there's a, there is an urgency uh, to make the SDGs a reality and universities do have a critical role to play. I'd like to uh, 
just make a few points mainly about research in this talk, but I also want to conclude with an anecdote uh, at the end, which I'd like to go to full screen uh, my own my own profile. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. My talk really is is really a plea for inclusion, equity, and also we don't have time today, but to pick up on what Alex said is the issue of transdisciplinary tolerance. Um, that is something I won't address today, but it is something uh, near to our hearts in higher education in the fact of a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary education and research. Today, I was going to focus mainly on research and talk about um, issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion in research and removing barriers, systemic barriers to sort of public inclusion in research. In this exercise at McMaster, as we look at uh, this in formalized sort of analysis of what we do and how we do it, we look at innovation and we look at themes such as commercialization and what are the barriers to innovation? Some of them are pretty fundamental. Students uh, cannot often get into commercialization courses. They can't be involved. Here at McMaster, at one of our institutes, we have made a targeted uh, goal to include students from the community that may not have normally been involved in this type of innovative research at a very young age, at the high school age, so that they can become infected with ideas of innovation and make contributions uh, relating to what some of their thoughts and thinking are. The other issue is a holistic cross-campus approach. And in thinking about the SDGs, in some ways we were stimulated by the Times ranking, of course, an external motivator to look at um, a framework that would be useful in looking at what we do in terms of our curriculum and our student engagement. And this has allowed us again to look at the entire campus. What do we all do in SDGs? What, how do we teach it? What type of programming are we doing? Does it, what SDG does it address? This not only um, infects students right from the beginning when they enter the university to look at the SDGs, but to reflect on them and actually to make a contribution in possible solutions. Next slide, please. And a very important point, which has been alluded to and discussed uh, by our previous speakers is to look at what is our societal impact? What is our relevance to our local community? As we know, globalization the definition we use anyway in global health is local, national, and international. So working directly with our own community, looking at forging local solutions to share globally are very important. There are major initiatives going on within our local community. Hamilton as a city is beset with its own issues and some very important research is going on in terms of poverty alleviation and it crosses all disciplines, health, geography, economics, to try to help our local community address some of their pressing issues. Again, using the SDG as a framework, it's um, very logical in order to use this as a community. Collaboration is really important. And I think, again, our previous speakers talked about working together across faculties, disciplines, and institutions. There are natural barriers. Um, in universities. Universities, the way they're organized, goes back to the beginning of time, departments, schools, faculties. Traditional disciplines were created hundreds of years ago. And it's very difficult to break into that traditional disciplinary structure. It was very suitable, I think, for the first hundred years. It's less suitable now. Categorization within a discipline recognizing that we actually go across disciplines has been a barrier, systemic barrier. Universities have not been too successful in reorganizing themselves. However, uh, initiatives such as open universities, open networks of knowledge learning, 
they have broken through this uh, traditional disciplinary framework and allowed access to education um, that students can avail themselves of beyond the traditional university. And finally, I really wanted to talk about the cultivation of partnerships. And that includes government, community, UN stakeholder relationships are key, which we've seen today. And you see the speakers represent the different areas. However, it's, it's somewhat even bigger than that. Universities and, and institutions of higher education, if they do collaborate, for example, in University 21, University 21 and uh, other large university collaborations, do allow us a chance to dialogue and to look at access and barriers to inclusion and equity. And it allows us to work as a much larger group versus our own one university or a university within our province or our country. We can look across many countries and discuss issues of access and inclusion. Universities traditionally have not been open access. There have been movements in the past 40 years for open access. Certainly knowledge has broken forth thanks to the, the internet. Knowledge is readily available, readily accessible. However, when you come to university education and admission to university, it's not so easy. There was uh, a well-known author who gave a story about going to university. He was a very poor young man and he used to sit on a subway and he used to watch people get off at a certain stop. And this was a stop where there was a very large university. He'd watch every morning on his way to work as a cleaner. He'd look at these people, they're around the same age as him, some older, some younger. And he thought, where are they going? What are they doing? And one morning he decided to, he, had, he was a little early for work, so he decided to get off at that stop with them. And he went with the group walking towards the university. He then decided, what was this institute all about? And he took one of his days off, he got on the subway, got off at the same stop with all these people, and he followed some of them to the library the university library. And he sat in the university library and he took a books from shelves and he read it and he thought, you know, this is something I would like to be involved in. He then went to the extreme that he went to the library bookstore. He saved up his money. He bought a university jacket with a logo. He then got back on the subway. He came, he sat in the library with his jacket on. He then took up his courage. He tells the story to go to speak to the university admissions office. They looked at his qualifications, or you might say his non-qualifications, and they said, you can never get into this. You don't have the appropriate grades. However, he took this further and he didn't stop. He waited two more years when he then became eligible as a mature student. The mature student categorization about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, allowed many people to come in. In other words, institutes of higher education did not look at your grades. They actually looked at where you were in life, what you did, and you could come in as a mature student, often coming in part-time and going to full-time. This young man pursued his dream over a decade to get into an institution of higher learning. He finally did it, and now he is a very well-known author. This is an example of inclusion and equity. And this is where universities and institutions of higher learning have to look at what are the systemic barriers to going to university. And community colleges, to a certain extent, they were created in Canada after much discussion, partly because universities could not handle the number of people wanting to go to institutions of higher learning. Plus, we wanted institutions that were a little bit more open to different learners. It took us 20 years in Canada to take our community college system and harmonize it with our universities. When I was a student, 
when it, this was true of engineering, nursing to a certain extent. If you came from a college, if you took a technology in engineering and they represented the three or four major areas, civil, mechanical, etc. If you went to a community college and you want to enter university engineering, you had to take the entire four years over again. These, what, these are what I call systemic barriers to higher education. And if we don't pick up on some of these barriers as institutions of higher education, we will become further and further more and more divided from our local communities. And I'll use one other example before I close. Many of our communities have refugees within our communities. They have a barrier, just like the young writer of getting into universities and colleges. They often come to countries severely traumatized and also they come without papers. This for institutions of higher education can be quite a challenge because the paper trail that recognizes our various accomplishments to get us into universities is often missing. How many communities have opened their doors to refugees? I'll give you an example, a further example, and then I will close. Would this be successful if education opened its doors a bit, governments agreed? I think it would be. If we look historically back after World War II, one of the great wars, Canada opens it, opened its doors to those returning, and in fact, indeed, those who had stayed within the country towards the war effort. Many of those people coming back had maybe perhaps just finished high school. Perhaps their education had been interrupted by the war, not unlike our refugees. The universities opened their doors. They allowed those people to come in. How well did they do? Did we track them in terms of research? No, but by all accounts and historical documents, they did quite well. Universities could do the same. They could look at the issues of inclusion and equity. They could look at their local communities. We've heard how important higher education is to the sustainable development goals. In order to do that, we should begin to look at opening a little bit the traditional barriers to entrance to universities. And with that, I'll close and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, and I, I couldn't agree more that, um, that the, the question of access to higher education is a, is a key question uh, because the barriers that you mentioned, of course, include many, many different types of barriers, right? There are the, the traditional ones that one thinks about, such as financial barriers, but you mentioned many other ones that are equally as important background, lack of credentials, uh, language skills, uh, and um, so one could argue that uh, even creating the best uh, possible university or higher education system um, will not work very well if we don't uh, give appropriate access to, uh, to the people who, who will actually drive our futures. And uh, so I really appreciate your, your comments in that, in that regard. Uh, let me now uh, invite uh, Dr. Greg Moran uh, to, uh, to share his thoughts with us. Greg he currently is, the, is with Academics Without uh, Borders, uh, which, uh, which, of which McMaster is, is also a member. And in fact, uh, at the present time, we are the nominal host institution for, for Academics Without Borders. So uh, Greg, I very much look forward to your comments. Thank you, Peter. And uh, it's just, uh, as the others have said, it's a, an incredible pro uh, pleasure to be here this morning and a real privilege hearing, hearing already the, uh, the very interesting and stimulating comments of my fellow panelists. And of course, it's a particular pleasure for me as Executive Director of Academics Without Borders to take part in a, in a panel that's been organized by McMaster University, as, as Peter said, our, our host institution, and, and their, their support is incredibly important to us. 
I'm, I'm going to try and, and, and address four questions that I, that I hope I can, I can uh, persuade you are interrelated around the issue of uh, higher education and the SDGs. And the first one um, is a, a seemingly a kind of simple one, which is, are the SDGs important? And, and I think that our, uh, the panelists already have, have made points which suggest that the answer to that question is very much in the affirmative. I, I have to admit that something that has 17 goals and 169 targets, for me, it, it, it initially sort of said, well, do we really need that much complexity? But perhaps that's the price that we pay when we, when we have 193 countries agreeing to a way to build, um, as Andrea's uh, slides reminded me of McMaster's catchphrase, to build a brighter world. That at Western, we talk about building ethnic Western. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, at Academics Without Borders, uh, building a better world. And it's a complex business. And, and uh, it, I think that the SDGs provide a really important framework or touchstone for us as individuals, organizations, or universities to ask, are we doing things that are, are moving us in that way and to do it collectively? So I do think it's important. And I'd, I'd like to just take a few minutes to, to reflect on a kind of important debate, I think, that happened in Nature magazine in July of this year when some some very well-informed, well-intentioned individuals argued that the pandemic really, including an editorial, argued that the pandemic uh, was a reason to re reset or reconsider, revise the, the SDGs for a number of really good reasons. I mean, arguing that the, the, the massive change in the financial wherewithal of the world, the particular strife, that uh, the poorer countries of the world were, were under as opposed to, as, as a result of the pandemic, the financial issues that were raised for the, for the wealthier countries of the world made the, made the goals that much more difficult to achieve. Colleagues at, at Brookings University, you know, for me wrote a very simple letter, which I'll take the time to read because it doesn't take long, but I think makes really important points that are important to reflect on now at a time when we might think that there are more pressing problems that, that we have to worry about rather than the longer term sustainable goals. And this is a, a, a letter that was published in August and it, it basically it was headed uh, in a multi-pronged global crisis. Now is not the time to reconsider the UN sustainable development goals. The COVID-19 crisis stems from exactly the type of interconnected failure that the SDGs aim to address. This moment requires absolute clarity while we continue to fight for the world that we need. Although many SDGs might now seem harder to achieve, the pandemic is not a reason to scale them back. On the contrary, it reinforces why the goals were established in the first place. To chart a better course towards common economic, social, and environmental ambitions that will guarantee humanity's long-term future. COVID-19 does not alter the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or ocean acidification, nor does it mitigate the need to end pointless deaths and persistent inequity. In 2015, the SDGs from an, emerged from a painstaking three-year diplomatic negotiation among 193 countries. Amid current geopolitical tensions, it is unlikely that all these countries could reach a better consensus today on this or any topic. Whatever their imperfections, the SDGs are a North Star to help us to rebuild after today's crisis. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think that a focus on this framework, on this structure is critical to build that better world that we're all talking about. So my second point and second question is uh, what does pursuit of the SDGs have to do with the fundamental function of higher education? Um, we tend to think of research and education as being the core functions of a university or, or a college of higher education. But I'm, I'm, I always like to remind myself that these are simply subcategories of a much broader overarching purpose, and that is to serve society. And if, we, if the things we're doing in any of those areas are not serving the society in the sense of making a better world, then we need to reconsider what we're doing. And the world changes all the time. It's changing around us in important ways. So we have to reevaluate what we're doing. And I would argue that although clearly research and education done well can, can serve society and do, does serve society demonstrably, there's the, the issue of pursuing the support of the SDGs is an important direct role that we have to embrace much 
much more fully in the university. And it's not foreign to our purpose. It, in fact, is at the heart of, of what we do in universities and colleges. And so I think this kind of work that is very deliberately aimed at, at identifying societal problems and crises and challenges and opportunities that, that are outlined in the, in the SDGs needs to be embraced fully and recognized as really part of who we are, part of the DNA, part of the origins of higher education. My third question, and, and uh, that, I, that I think is related, and, and my third point then, is um, how, do, how do universities and colleges facilitate, break down barriers that might be there to our faculty, our, college, our schools, our students even, in more directly asking themselves, how can we pursue the SDGs? And I say the SDGs are not some set aside set of goals. They're, they're core issues about how we serve society. And uh, again, as I said, Previously, although research and education, indeed, in, in demonstrable ways, and as, as Andrea argued, I think so well, can serve those societies, those functions. We also need to, to free up um, our faculty and students and staff to more directly embrace the notion that we can actually work with community groups locally, that we can work collectively and internationally to ask what we can do about things like poverty, how we can contribute to, in a very direct way to, 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 to the problem of, of clean water, to food supply, to peace and security, to gender equity, whatever the, the, the goal is that we're focusing on, and do that in a way that is a knowledge transfer kind of activity. We embraced in the last three decades with some difficulty the notion that we could transfer the knowledge that exists in our universities to increase the wealth, the prosperity of our communities through commercialization, et cetera. That, that actually was a big step for many of the universities, certainly the one that I worked at for most of my, my career. But we've done that now. It's recognized as part, it's valued, it's celebrated within our institutions. We have to do the same thing with these problems, with the problems that I just articulated and are so well delineated in the SDGs so that uh, as I work with colleagues through Academics Without Borders, I often get the question, how do I get my university to recognize what I'm doing uh, as a volunteer expert with Academics Without Borders, to recognize that work in the same way they would recognize my achievements in the classroom, in the laboratory, in, in my research. And universities have to ask themselves that question. Are they doing enough to recognize those things as part of legitimate and important part of faculty role? and as intellectually challenging and as impactful as anything else that, that members of faculty and indeed that the university does. My final and fourth point is that as, as several of the, of the speakers have already said and, and that is in fact reflected in the whole nature of this panel, um, the work of universities in pursuit of the SDGs is global. It, it's, it's local. And, it, and many important local things can be done, but I, but I think, as Andrea said, often our, the things we do locally serve broader uh, or have lessons for, for broader global uh, functions and, and, and objectives. And for universities, and here I'm, I'm revealing my, my, uh, my biases, I don't think there can be any more important or more obvious way to serve the global purpose of pursuit of the SDGs or support of the SDGs than by working with our colleagues at universities and colleges in other parts of the world to help strengthen their institutions. As much as bringing international students to Canada and other parts of the wealthy parts of the world is important, that's never going to serve the full purposes of higher education in uh, the low and middle income countries of the world. Our colleagues in universities and colleges around the world recognize that they can play the role in making, they have an important role to play in increasing the prosperity, the health, the, the sense of justice and the stability of their countries. But often they don't have the resources on their own to do what they know they can do. We can help our colleagues there by collaborating with them to make, to increase the capacity and the quality and the impact of their country, of, the, of their programs. We're fortunate in places like Canada, universities like McMaster, uh, all over um, the, the, the wealthier countries of the world. We're fortunate in having been able to develop these incredible institutions 
that are the that have incredible resources in in the the, the individuals and the, the collectives uh, that that live in our universities and colleges. We need to share some of that wealth. We need to do knowledge transfer to help our colleagues increase the, the, the quality of what they're able to do and the impact they can have on their societies. And as I said, that, that's at the heart of what Economic Without Borders do, does, in realizing the incredible generosity of individuals, individual faculty members, and their interest in working with colleagues all around the world uh, on collaborative projects to enhance the, the capacity of universities. But this can also be done in, in other ways and through other mechanisms that, that universities, if they ask themselves how they might do that, uh, I think will realize and do it in a way that doesn't involve skimming off you know, finances in order to, to enrich their own resources, but rather it's done in a, in a, in a generous but enlightened self-interest way. Um, and let me just end by saying that, that you know, we're, we're increasingly living in, a, in an undeniably interconnected world, even though many people would like to deny that. Uh, as we say with COVID-19, we will not have, have, have ended the pandemic until it's ended everywhere. And so too with the SDGs, we will not have achieved um, the goals of the SDGs until they're, they're achieved globally. And um, it, it is inconceivable to me that the SDGs in themselves will be sustainable uh, without the universities around the world who are capable of producing the kind of knowledge, but most importantly, that the leaders in all areas of society who are capable of achieving the objectives of the SDGs and ultimately working with their, 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 their fellow citizens to sustain those. So thank you, Peter, I'll, I'll end on that. Well, thank you very much, Greg. Uh, and uh, thank you again uh, to, to all four panelists for your uh, insightful and quite remarkable uh, comments. Um, I would like to move now uh, into the Q&A uh, section. And uh, we've received several questions already in the Q&A. And I'll start with one um, that just as it so happens, connects directly um, to some of uh, some of Greg's uh, last comments about interconnectivity. It also connects directly to uh, Ramu's comments about the SDGs being this child of the UN, but now is developing as it grows up. Um, and so, I would like to uh, to ask the question which was posed by Nevin. And the question uh, says, in light of digital learning due to COVID-19, do you think connectivity to all needs to be one of the SDG targets with indicators to measure progress towards connectivity to all? Very little can be achieved if students have no access to the internet. And uh, so uh, maybe maybe in, an, in a somewhat unfair way, but I'll I'll ask Ramu first to comment as he is representing somewhat the the UN, the the parent of the of, of the SDGs. But then I'll, uh, I would like to open it up to to all panelists. Of course, I think this is a very very interesting question. Uh, thank you, Peter. And I was fascinated by that question from Dr. Dr. Chabra because. I remember even before this pandemic began reading an interview with her as a change maker at McMaster where she said, all future learning needs to be digital and had a quotation about, you cannot have digital earning without digital learning. And I think that really underlines your question, Dr. Chabra. My honest opinion, and, and, and I'm not sure how politically correct this is, is that we really need a global women's movement to make digital, learning and digital access a human right. We are more than 70 years after the Declaration of Human Rights was uh, concluded at a time when all this seemed science fiction. We are now at a time when it's absolutely essential, not only to learning, but for the everyday conduct of life. And I frankly don't have much trust, trust in men to be able to lead this. I think just as in the history of the United Nations, women have championed causes which are not necessarily directly their own, but are universal. This should be one such cause. I've long been apprehensive, not only in the context of digital learning, but purely access to the internet, how a simple thing like withholding electricity to a community 
can completely deny that community access to the internet, which is what authoritarian governments may choose to do. And that remains a threat. But in addition to that threat, there is the really the technological aspect that you mentioned of the sheer assurance of connectivity. We've all been in situations where we lose our Wi-Fi or something similar to that. But if it is done with intent and purpose, it should be an offense against universal human rights and certainly against our common aspiration for the SDGs. Uh, Alex, would you like to maybe add your your thoughts to this to this what I consider really a key question? Yeah. I think uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, this is really important. Uh, I, I think if we believe in universal access to education, and if education is going to underpin just about every other sustainable development goal, and if we're moving away from in-person learning, especially constrained by the fact that the virus is on the march and schools are forced to close, and in-person learning is becoming uh, perhaps a health risk, uh, then governments and the international community, the global collective, uh, must put its energy behind uh, providing equitable access to, to internet uh, and, and device resources uh, to enable children to, to, to access education. Uh, I think several years ago, uh, the world was extremely excited uh, about the possibility of one laptop per child. Um, and and, and they're, they're, they're enormous opportunities for us to do this. Uh, the, the cost of broadband internet uh, across the world has, has collapsed. It's crushed. It's it's pretty much affordable. Uh, it, it is nearly as important, uh, verging on the on the on the edge of uh, of a right uh, to provide students with what we call in this part of the world internet bundles, just as much as you'd provide them with a pencil and a rubber and a a, a writing pad. Um, so I, I think every each, each and every conversation around equitable access to learning resources must essentially include equitable access to internet resources. Uh, those two things must now go hand in hand, uh, just as critical elements of the capacity of students to, 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 to access education. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm cognizant of time and we have uh... Uh, we have a number of additional questions that I would like to address, but I, I would like to ask Andrea to, to maybe just very quickly comment. Um, I mean, you've been running uh, a very successful program in global health uh, that connects uh, students from many different institutions around the world. Um, and, and connectivity must be one of the key elements of, of making this work. It is, and it um, again, it is strengthened by partnerships. So, for example, for years we had to use the uh, Maastricht infrastructure <laughs> because our our own local infrastructure wasn't good enough to beam to our different partnerships that we have now become, of course, a little stronger. But that's an example of partnership, university partnerships where one university can use the strength of another university in terms of access. And I'll close there, Peter, but I can use other examples in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, let me move on uh, to uh, two other questions that are somewhat thematically connected. And, and let me pose the two questions uh, together. Uh, Ashwin Sharma writes, how do we bridge the disconnect between sustainable research and innovation on the one hand and industry and implementation on the other hand? And then Julian Gowart, who is the chair of our Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology says that the department has recently proposed and received approval for a new undergraduate program in sustainable chemistry. And the UN SDGs are a major focus of the new courses. And another goal is to provide experiential training with partner organizations who are working in their companies to meet sustainability metrics in their processes. And there's Arsenal Metal and L'Oreal and 3M. And so the question is, could one comment on striking a balance uh, with the need for discipline expertise, that is being, for instance, a chemist, uh, with the need for interdisciplinary training exposure to, at the undergraduate level and being able to work uh, with the with the private sector. 
Um, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, who wants to pick this up first, but maybe, maybe Greg, uh, from your expertise in working with um, partner institutions around the world, um, from your experience, how is, how is this balance struck um, uh, between, between discipline-specific academic expertise and then transferring uh, that knowledge to working with the private sector or having a real practical impact? I, th I think I can see two points to make here. One, one is that, um, that obviously these are, these are longstanding challenges of how one, how one makes the leap between what's happening in a lab or, or at a university to an application and, and seeing that happen in industry and seeing that knowledge transferred in a way that actually solves the problem. And it's not a, that's not a small step as, as anyone who's worked in these areas knows. And that's as true, whether we're talking about social problems or we're talking about innovation and discoveries that become commercial, commercializable uh, products. I think that, I think this has to do with a, with a deliberate, that the way this can be addressed is by being deliberate about it. I think that the funding agencies, the governments, et cetera, can be deliberate about saying, we are going to give preference to those kinds of developments that actually are serving the broader needs of society and, and ask themselves, you know, preferentially, are we going to support something that will solve some of these larger problems? And you've seen a lot of that happening during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I mean, incredible investments made in areas that would not have been made in in the absence of the crisis. The issue about interdisciplinarity is one that's haunted me uh, my entire career. Um, my colleagues, you know, and, and I, forgive me, chemists uh, uh, around the world, chemists are, are perhaps the best example of people who think that a, a student must take no courses but chemistry courses. If you're going to be an honors chemistry student, you must have all your courses be chemistry courses, even to the extent, in my experience, where they said, where I had people say to me, well, there's not enough room for those mathematics courses because if we enter those into the program. So I think we have to, I think there has to be a, a mindset change. And I think it's happening where people recognize that although disciplinary expertise is important and, and you know, I would never take away from that. Um, I think it's, I, forgive me, I think it's overdone. I think knowledge is something we can achieve in a whole range of ways these days. And what's really critical are the skills that are necessary to address problems. And as my colleagues have, have made this point very eloquently previously, it is those skills that we need to foster. And those skills require transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary solutions. Um, there are very few places where a pure disciplinary attack, where one is working alone, is going to solve the kinds of complex multi-determined problems that we're talking about here today. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, Alex, um, I'm picking up on your, on your term that I had not heard before, but I, I like a lot, uh, the, the unity of knowledge. Is that maybe one way of looking at it, that you need to be well-founded in, in a particular discipline in order to move up to, to create this unity and being able to bring in um, other viewpoints and, and expand beyond the, the disciplinary expertise? Uh, thanks, Peter. So I, I think, you know, we really are working with a, a very constrained set of, uh, of opportunities um, in the way that we construct the academy in the modern age. Uh, I, I, I think you know, we are really not alive to the fact that our students can learn tremendous amount of stuff uh, over and above what we can prescribe and code in, in, in content, uh, in academic programming. Uh, so that a broad-based undergraduate education is, is absolutely critical. And to create a, a, a basis for students to learn to think around problem solving, to bring all the tools that are necessary to solve a problem, to flip the classroom and create a problematic for the students to think at, and then to find the areas of knowledge that they need to understand to then bring to solving those problems as a basis uh, for doing this. I think, uh, I don't remember his name, but it was a professor at the University of Wisconsin who, who once said that he is not, he's not in the business, he's a, he's a Nobel laureate. He's not in the business of, of, of teaching 
physics by creating physicists. Uh, so I, I think oftentimes we, we teach about various subject matters, uh, subject content areas, but we don't think about how would we, these students operate in the real world as a physicist. And, and, and the world could do with a lot of physics uh, oriented solutions, but it has to be in a complex matrix of other disciplines coming together to create a community of problem solvers. And, and, and I think to the extent that we can create those multi-ethnicities in the early formative stages of, of, of young students to be able to pick up elements of sociology and anthropology, for instance, uh, to, to solve a mundane problem as indoor house uh, respiratory problems in Africa with uh, clean cooking stoves. It is a problem that is inside uh, physics and, and design of, 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 of cooking appliances but you also have to understand the anthropology of an African society or, or women and how they create uh, uh, a meal together as a social uh, encounter. Uh, so I think that there's every merit and we should get away from this constrained construction of education as if we were in the 19th century where we were the, the sage in the stage and the students just had to receive the knowledge from us but enable them to construct an approach to problem solving and then learn all the basic elements that are needed to create those kinds of problems. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Ramu, I wonder um, if, one, if one were to adopt um, this pathway that, that, that Greg and Alex just, just outlined, could one then maybe see the, the UN SDGs as, as, as the framework within which these, or as, as, a, as the guiding principles uh, that one could use to develop these cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, holistic approaches to problem solving? I certainly think so, Peter, but I'm also very cognizant of the fact that one should not um, lose the trees for the forest, so to speak. In other words, you must give every discipline its own, its own um, stature. I was struck by what Dr. Goward said about sustainable chemistry. I'd like to share a brief story from the United Nations a few years ago the delegation of Spain proposed having an international year for sustainable gastronomy. And when the resolution was actually printed, somewhere down the line, the G was lost and it came out as the International Year of Sustainable Astronomy. <laughs> and you had all these delegations there with this paper asked to speak and every one of them improvised. You had delegations talking about astronomy without ever having been in a laboratory or near a telescope and they were all good ideas. So I think the point is that if you put your mind to it, you can really take any academic discipline and give it the worth it's due and then integrate it as, as both Greg and Alex and you Peter have said into a larger transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary process. And um, to go to, to Ashwin's question, I think one important uh, facet of, uh, of studenthood and scholarship is to show industry that it has needs it does not itself recognize. Now, Ashwin has worked in Uganda with this mobile app called Numida, which is providing financial assistance from banks to entrepreneurs in need. Now, I would imagine that Numida never realized that they had the need for this until Ashwin went to them. And I think this is something we as responsible citizens have to do because we are serving ourselves in terms of our career options and paths but also serving the particular industry we go to, and then the larger global pattern, which the SDGs represent and the UN represents. Thank you very much, Ramu. Uh, I'd like to move on to the, to the next question that was also posted by Ashwin, but it directly follows up on, on Andrea's uh, comments regarding access uh, to post-secondary education. And Ashwin asked, should there be any limitations to who can pursue post-secondary education? Um, and, and I guess by extension, uh, if there should be any, what should they be? Uh, you know, which gets us, of course, into the messy part of qualifications and how to assess who's qualified and who's not. Um. I think the key is uh, pathways. And I think uh, creating pathways to education within some flexibility for what we call 
different crisis situations, and I use the example of refugees. So what type of pathways do colleges and universities create for access? What type of learning is, it, is um, assessed? And what type of education do people need? I think it's become clear that education is paramount to the understanding of complex problems, as we've seen from our recent example in North America. If people don't have access to education, um, we'll advance only at a certain level. So it, it, it does uh, behoove the universities and colleges and structures across the world to look at educating people. And how can we, and I, the SDGs as a framework is a brilliant framework. We have worked now with it for the past few years at McMaster and it really does help address many issues and addresses the transdisciplinary nature of complex problems as well. So uh, we definitely support the SDGs as an academic framework, as a, as a framework for examining pathways to education. So that's what I would say, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to move on to the next question, which is uh, quite, quite an interesting one. It, um, it concerns barriers again, in this case, not the barriers to higher education per se, but the barriers uh, against addressing some of the sustainability issues. And the question is whether we thought as a panel uh, that capitalism might be one of the barriers to addressing many of the sustainability issues and whether the panelists felt that there might be a better slash hybrid system or a replacement system either needed or already be on the horizon. So I don't know who wants to pick this up. Um, um, Ramu, maybe, I'll, I'll start with you, but please jump in as you see fit. Uh, thank you, Peter. My, my only reaction would be that while the sustainable development goals are universal, the means to their realization need not be common or uniform or universal. So every nation, every society, every community will determine how each particular goal and how the goals collectively can be realized. And certainly if the capitalist model works to assure the goals in a particular context, I don't think we should preclude it. But we should not automatically say that this is going to be the size that fits all or this is the size that we have to abandon for all. Right. I, I think this is a uh, this is a comment that um, without putting it on the spot, Greg, but uh, the, the theme of one size that does not fit all is, is something that permeates our interactions within academics without borders, of course, because we deal with so many different institutions in so many different jurisdictions and so many different countries. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad Ramu answered that question first. I, I, it was a difficult one, and he a, a answered it in a very tactful, diplomatic way. I, I think that I would, I, I would agree. I mean, I guess two points again. I would agree with Ramu that, you know, to the extent that a, that a, a capitalist model works to solve particular problems, then you know, it, it, it can certainly that's the kind of incentive model that that, that underlies the capitalist system can can be very powerful, I think, demonstrably uh, around the world and throughout history. Unconstrained capitalism with, without some kind of sort of framework around it, I, I don't think is, 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 is going to be the solution to our problems. Uh, I think that, that, you know, that there has to be a, a mixed model of some sort. Um, but that's a, obviously a much larger question, which in many ways, I, I my opinion is, is, is I'm, I'm largely unqualified to answer in any kind of dignified way. Um, but I think your point, Peter, is a really important one, is, is that, you know, when we're working with, with communities, countries, uh, with different cultures, different backgrounds, different political models, um, we need to meet people where they are. It's something that I, I often think about in, in Academics Without Borders, is that 
we need to, uh, to, 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 uh, to invite our colleagues around the world to identify their priorities, their problems, their issues, um, and, and where they want to meet us if and when they want our support and assistance. Um, it, it's, we are only there, you know, it's in, in these kind of collaborative ventures, we are partners and, and we must collaborate and, and respect the systems that people work within. Uh, so I think sort of doctrinaire approaches here, uh, I'm not going to get it to where we need to go. Thank you. Uh, Alex, would you like to comment also? Uh, so uh, very briefly, I think capitalism might actually offer a lot of interesting solution spaces. Uh, I guess the question is, what are the incentives? How do you line up the markets? How do you create credible institutions of policy and, and regulation to then nudge capitalism in the right direction? How do you put, you know, metaphorically, your thumb on the scale to move capitalism in, in, in the direction of common social good? Uh, uh, I think there, the enormous examples uh, in, in our part of the world, especially with, say, for instance, access to telephony, mobile telephony, for instance, that is now ubiquitous. Every African home uh, has access to a phone. And it is now because government distributed those phones. So there's a market that was created when they started. Uh, phones could cost as much as uh, $5,000 for, for a handset. Now, for $50, you can get a phone. So just look at how the price has compressed and how the technology has even, has even improved. The $5,000 phone couldn't even send a text message to save itself. Now you've got a smartphone for under $50. So I, I, I think the real question is, how do governments start to respond to the right, rig the right policies and incentives around the owners of capital and nudge them in the direction of sustainable development goals? Uh, for instance, uh, clean energy and removing diesel polluting vehicles off our streets for instance, what is the incentive mechanism and the market orientation that then creates a huge demand that disincentivizes polluting technologies? So I think it's really kind of uh, figuring out, but creating the, and enabling that enterprise and ingenuity to flourish is really at the heart of the lifeblood of capitalism, which we should harness for a positive, for, to a positive end. Thank you very much, Alex. Um... Cognizant of time, we have uh, one minute left, and I would like to give Andrea uh, the, the final word, uh, maybe some concluding remarks um, uh, to end this most interesting and uh, engaging uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you, Peter, and I'd like to thank uh, you and the office for hosting this and the panel members for joining us. Um, some thoughts about the pandemic, what the pandemic has done has actually opened up knowledge. Many, many uh, Zoom meetings, Zoom lectures are being given that people can enter into that before would never have access. So that's the exciting part about the pandemic. There are other parts that are not so exciting. I just wanted to also discuss about the capitalism. These are the kinds of questions our local communities are actually struggling with themselves. And so I was just thinking we should create as a sequela of this open panel discussions with transdisciplinary students from partner universities that we would open um, to as many um, participants as possible to address these, these issues. I think people would embrace the discussion. So some exciting ideas have been generated this morning for some future activities. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. And I also would personally like to thank all of the uh, panelists, uh, Ramu, Alex, Greg, and, and Andrea. I'd like to thank uh, my um, staff member, the, uh, Nicole Longstaff, who has been instrumental uh, mm -hmm. in putting this panel together. And without her, her expertise and skill, uh, this would not have happened. So thank you very much. For, for all the time and effort that you have put into this. Um, and uh, finally, I would, like to, I would like to thank all of the participants. Thank you for your questions that are, were very meaningful and thoughtful. And uh, I hope um, you, found, uh, you found the event uh, uh, interesting. I'd like to draw your attention also to the fact that this event is only one of many 
in our two-week event series uh, called McMaster Global. And I would like to encourage you to check on the McMaster Global website uh, to see which other events might be of interest. So with that, um, I would like to thank everybody once again. And thank you very much for your participation and enjoy your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you.